I'm Hugo Freudenthal, and this is my wife, Anita, and we're here to tell you a little bit about the space program and what we did it back in the 1960s or so. So, um, uh, are you going to ask some questions or uh, lead into it? You can plow into well, how they I guess, found you. <laughs> I guess, how do I, how, I'm not a, a, a space scientist, so how did I get involved in the space program in the first place? Well, it's an interesting story. I'm a marine biologist, basically, and a professor. And at the time, back in the 1960s, I was a staff member at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. And we specialized, we had a very successful laboratory specializing in the growing of algae. Now, you could ask, what does the algae have to do with the space program? Well, NASA had, in the early days of the space program, NASA had this idea of growing algae in space. Now, the reasons for doing that would be, one, the algae would produce oxygen. Two, the algae could feed on the waste materials that the astronauts produced. And, th <coughs> and th <coughs> thirdly, um, they could eat the algae. So nutrition and waste removal. Of course, it turned out to be a kind of a dumb idea, but they were ready to invest money in it. And Republic Aviation on Long Island had a contract with NASA to investigate this, the algae problem and some other aspects of space program, which I'll tell you about later. And um, they had this contract, and they didn't have the slightest idea what they were doing. So they had heard about the work that I did on growing algae, and they came to me for some consulting. I did some consulting for them, and um, their response was, hey, how would you like to come work for us? as head of our life science program. So I thought about it. I was very happy in my university position at the museum, but the opportunity to work with an aerospace company, because my real love was aerospace, the opportunity to work with them was just too much to turn down. So I gave them a figure which in academic terms was totally ridiculous, and their response was, can you start Monday? <laughs> I said I'd do it if I could keep my university position. They said it was okay with them. Can so I, I just interject? Yeah, go ahead. When they were sort of, quote, interviewing him, um, and the reason they got him in the first place was they had a very, what they thought was a difficult problem to be solved. And they first asked him, could he solve this problem? And he solved it in about 15 minutes. And so that's when they then said, can you start on Monday? <laughs> so he didn't. So I became director of life sciences at Republic Aviation. And um, we operated a research lab at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, that was investigating in addition to the algae problem, um, the microflora that grew on the, that grows on the body, because you know we have a lot of bacteria all over our body and so on. And the concern was that if you put the astronauts in a closed space cabin together, they'd only get covered with green slime or something. So we had volunteers that we locked up in a space cabin simulator about the size of a closet, about four of them, and we monitored their skin bacteria and their fecal bacteria and their nutrition and the intake and their excretion and so on. And um, uh, that program went on for several years. I, uh, I have an interesting as aspect of that. You know, we took these guys who were basically volunteers. They came up from Kentucky. They didn't know much. And they just stayed in the cabin. There was supposed to be nine months in this cabin. And um, they stayed in until they got enough money to buy themselves a car. And then they said, oh, let me out, let me out. So we couldn't have these experiments where the guys kept quitting on us. So I got the bright idea to use 
the lowest form of animal life as our subjects. You know what that is? A graduate student. So. <laughs> and we had a lot of them. <laughs> I got graduate students to be our volunteers, and their thesis was their experience in a closed cabinet environment. Yeah. And, and if, uh, they, if they bounced out ahead of time, he warned them they would get an F. We, we did other things there too. We worked on the problem of converting urine into drinking water. And there's many a, a, a um, aerospace medical association meeting that I went to where I take a glass and hold up. This isn't urine here. This is iced tea. Uh, uh, <laughs> looks like urine. <laughs> Same color. Uh, and. Um, we can, there's no, it's really no problem making fresh water out of urine. There's lots of ways of doing it. The problem was that it took two pounds of fuel to produce one pound of water. So there's no percentage of doing that. But now I understand on the International Space Station, they told me that um, they have a method for converting all the moisture and urine and feces in the space station into drinking water. But from what I understand of the process, um, uh, it takes a lot of expendables, big filters and charcoal and other things, chemicals. So again, you, you can carry the water for less weight than all the equipment to go with it and the chemicals to make water. But you know, if we ever get a trip to Mars, the water problem is going to be a big problem. But drinking the urine isn't too bad. Yeah, I've, no. I've done it yeah. at the conference. You didn't drink water, urine, you drank reclaimed. Reclaimed. <laughs> reclaimed. <laughs> reclaimed urine. It, yeah. it, you um, can get past it. <laughs> so, um, now, one of the other problems we dealt with was... Uh, the exercising. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, the, the loss of calcium. Uh, well, the, one of the other things we were studying was calcium loss in the body. Because in the simulated cabin, we knew the um, amount of calcium they were taking in with their food. And we, when we had them in the, in the simulator, we could analyze the feces and so on, but we didn't know what happened in zero gravity. So NASA was coming along. Did they buy, remember Skylab, 1973? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, Skylab was our first space station. It was really the third stage of a Saturn rocket, fixed up as a habitability um, with bedroom, sleeping quarters and eating quarters and so forth. And the men lived in zero gravity for several months. Um, and what they needed was a means of collecting in zero gravity all of their waste, their urine, their feces, their vomit, uh, so that we can also analyze the calcium output. Now, we, you know, um, there really, before the space toil, there was no really collection device. When you, um, to collect your feces, they had a bag, like a Ziploc bag, with an adhesive lip on it. And when you made, you glued this thing to your backside and two little finger openings, finger cuts, and you reached in and pulled the turd into the bag and then closed the bag up and kneeled it up. But we needed something more practical. So we got, I won this $20 million contract to design and build the first space toilet. And um, uh, so, um, the idea was that in, in zero gravity, it would make, it would vector the urine and the feces into a collection bag. That bag would be then weighed, sealed, and uh, an aliquot taken, that's a small portion taken, and brought back to Earth for calcium analysis. And uh, believe it or not, the system worked beautifully. It was one of the few things that worked perfectly in space. Well, they needed, they needed that because they had first been testing the vomit and the urine and the feces on land with the volunteers. 
and the volunteers for the vomit were all the secretaries. Yeah, right. Who, after lunch, would be given a bag and ten dollars if they gave their vomit back <laughs> to Hugo. And yeah, let me tell you a story about that. Um, one day, and um, we 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 owned an airplane at the time. And one day we flew down to Houston because I wanted to show the kids who were, what, seven or eight, something like that, uh, the space rocks that had been brought back. And um, we, it was kind of a rough flight in our little plane. And my son... For the first time ever and only. He vomited in the plane in the collection bag. We got landed in Houston and he came through with a bag and said, Daddy, here, I need, you need this vomit for the space program. Where's my ten dollars, by the way? <laughs> oh, and well. then he was very upset when it went in the garbage. He wanted to bring it home, and it was for the program. Yeah. So, um, think of something else to say. Um, oh well, with the with the what we took care of the urine. Yeah. Just now we took care of the vomit. It was the feces. So one day at my laboratory, I got a phone call from Hugo saying, would it be okay if he brought home the feces and we put it in the microwave because they weren't sure, they had to figure out ahead of time how to preserve the feces that was going to be brought back. And should they broil it or should they bake it or should they put it in the microwave or whatever. And Microwaves had just come out, and I had a brand new microwave. And an enormous oven. So that was mm -hmm. one of the things that I used to get phone calls a lot in my lab. And after a while, when the phone rang and they say, it's Hugo for you, everybody in the lab would say, so what does he mm -hmm. want now? Yeah. So. But you know, now bring back a sample. In zero gravity, we had to weigh the sa How do you weigh something in zero gravity? Because it, there's no gravity, you can't use a scale or a balance. So um, our engineers, had, we had some very good engineers at Republic. They invented a means of putting the sample on an oscillating tray that vibrated back and forth. And the period of oscillation was equivalent of the mass of the thing. And that's how we weighed it. And then it had to take a sample. We use a radio isotope to measure the amount of sample to take it and tag it. And that was stuffed back into on the Apollo, was stuffed back into the old food where the food came out and brought back to Earth for analysis. It was really quite a program. Now, the uh, other thing that Hugo had us do, and when I say us, I mean it involved um, the two kids also because he needed some outside independent um, ideas and reports on the cleansers and the oh, yeah. food that was going to be fed. Yeah, one of the other things we, um, the astronauts wanted to be clean. Um, they were all Air Force people, Navy, Army people and so on. And they wanted to be clean. So we had to come up with detergents that could be used to keep their bodies clean, but yet you can't have bubbles floating around in the space cabin. If you liquid, if you, if you, if you try to pour liquid, it would break up into globules that would go floating around. Matter of fact, if you look at the early days of the mercury and uh, Gemini capsules, and you see kind of little stuff floating around, that's the globules of urine floating around. And part of the recreation was to take a paper napkin and try and pick up these globules. <laughs> and, um, so Hugo would bring home the, um, the cleansers yeah. because he would tell us that the astronauts didn't <clears throat> want to smell like a hospital and they didn't want to smell feminine. Remember, there were no women then. And they didn't want it to smell musky. And so they wanted for the shaving to have one kind and for the underarm and rear end. See, I knew something about um, 
cleanses because my my bachelor's is in pharmacy. I was originally a pharmacist, and um, I knew about detergents and cleansers and so on. So uh, we made a spray, aerosol cans originally with the um, detergents for body cleansing. And the sink you used was like a little fish tank. You put your hands into it and, and, the, and the vacuum pulled the, um, the same vacuum pump that you used to c collect the feces of the urine in the toilet also control the water in the sink. Yeah. So we had to check that there weren't any bubbles and it didn't leave for the, for the kitchen mm -hmm. recipe. Mm -hmm. It didn't leave um, stickiness yeah. or anything like that. And so he would bring home all the different products that they had created and we would sort of analyze them and go over them and talk mm -hmm. them over. And then he did that with the food also that um, they were preparing to give him. But tell him about, about the, how, you, how you sprayed the lady oh, in the Well, zero a lot gravity. of our test work was done in an aircraft called the Vomit Comet. That's a, a KC-135, which is really a 707 airliner, that would fly, dive, come up, make an arc, you got about 35 seconds of weightlessness as it came down, come down again, and and then um, climb again. And this is a picture here of me in the cabin, floating around, floating in midair in this cabin during zero gravity. So I've been in zero gravity several times, but to test this thing, the detergents, we had a Air Force uh, nurse. Um, dressed in flight boots and a blue bikini, and <laughs> we get we spray her down with detergents and wipe her off. So we had a lot of fun doing that. He said it was the only X-rated film in zero <laughs> gravity. Um, but you know, when when Kennedy gave his talk in 1961 of sending a man to the, this nation should commit itself to sending a man to the moon and bringing him back safely to Earth. He made that statement. We didn't have the slightest idea of how we were going to get to the moon. Um, we had one big asset. That was Werner von Braun, the rocket scientist. I knew von Braun very well. He would invite, invite but, Hugo to go down to South America. Ultimately, it cost, I think, the, I think the price tag, if I remember correctly, was something like $26 billion to get to the moon. $26 billion in dollars of 1961, of course, would be like $128 billion now. And um, when you think of what was done to get us there, the, just kind of imagine the computer system so that a rocket going up could, mer could rendezvous with another rocket, rocket in orbit. It's mind-boggling, and this was done with computers. There's less com computer power. There's more computer power in your car today than there was in those early spacecrafts. And, uh, uh, it was just a fantastic job. I think there were, at the peak, 200,000 workers who were working on the space program. You know, you can ask the question, was it worth it all? Well. You know, my cell phone here, I, my son is working in Beijing, China. Our son is working in Beijing, China. I can pick up my cell phone and speak to him in Beijing, China, the other side of the world, and he is just as clear as if he was, and that was due to the space program. Yeah, there were so many things besides Tang, the orange juice that came out. Do you remember, do you remember Tang, the oh, orange juice? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, what else we got to talk about? Well, I knew I, Ron Braun, I should mention him because he was an amazing person. He, um, uh, Nita has met Ron Braun several times also. And um, it just, uh, he, when you were with him, you were the most important thing in the world to him. He, he treated you that way. He, he knew how to 
organized people. And he was, of course, the architect that built the Saturn rocket. Let me tell you a little story about von Braun. Uh, I was having lunch with von Braun shortly before he died. And I said, hey, Bernard, what do you think we really accomplished? And he looked at me with his big blue eyes and he said, you know, Hugo, the thing we did that was most important was we taught industry the concept of reliability. He says, you know, you take a college TV set, take it out of the box, plug it in and it works, and it goes on working. We taught the concept of reliability. I think that's very important. And if you ever want to look at the toilet as it originally existed in Skylab, if you go to Washington to the Smithsonian Institute, there is a mock-up of Skylab. And they cut it in half, and there's a very narrow little boardwalk right through the center. And halfway down on the right is, mm -hmm. you look, and that's where you put your watches, <laughs> uh, so to speak. Mm -hmm. It's there on the wall. Um, and. Hugo working there was fascinating for the family, too, because we were so involved and we knew what he was doing. And he was always flying off to some Air Force base or federal um, area and would come back with fascinating stories about people and other things that were being done. So he really included well, we, we work all with, of us. Uh, the base, base, we work with, uh, with NASA Houston on the integration with the astronaut habitability. We work with Huntsville, Alabama, where Ron Braun was head leader, on the fabrication of the toilet and the um, construction, how it fit in the rocket ship. And we also work with NASA Ames on some aspects of the thing, too. So I was always traveling. I, 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 I literally slept with my bag packed by, by the side of my bed because I was always going to some place uh, in the program. What else did we do that was interesting? What else did you do? I think. Um, oh, well, um, a few years back when we went, we had a conference um, in Houston, and I surprised Hugo by paying for the special tour. There was just the normal tour and oh, then Cape Kennedy. extra. And we did the same thing at Cape Kennedy. And at each place when we got there, I happened to mention to the tour guide, or he would bring up something um, when we were in front of a special um, showcase that showed something. And in each case, they were so taken with him and what he had to say that they didn't know about. Here they were tour guides, and they were learning things from him that they told us we could come back the next day and finish off the tour and finish telling them everything, and we could come in free on the, on the tour. So even the tour guides were fascinated by his stories behind the scenes that they had never heard. So now you know we, we talk about going to the moon now. Um, what's the reason for going to the moon? Because it's there. The same reason you climb mountains because it's there. Um, but the problems that we have are insurmountable. What are we going to do? Uh, it's going to take several months to get to the moon. What are we going to do about food? Um, you know, what we're really talking about building is something the size of the Starship Enterprise, like remember from Star Wars? Yeah, and um, what are we going to do about waste? What are we going to do about water, oxygen? These are, are we going to, we're really going to have to build something as big as the Starship Enterprise to take care of all these human factors that are necessary for sending a man on that long duration mission. And now that you're saying sending a man on that mission. Or a lady. They're, right, there are now ladies. And the reason there are ladies is that Hugo 
had to get the engineers and whoever to help design the ladies' toilet. And I got a phone call at the lab one day, and all the, all the lab assistants said, what does he want now? And I turned around and I said, he wants me to be the model for the ladies' <laughs> toilet. And I regret to this day that I had to say no because I had seen the volume that he had created at the end of the men's toilet. And I had seen all the photographs of the trajectory and the volume and the this and the that. And he had said, because I had said, what do we have to do? He said, well, we have to put cameras. In zero gravity, we had, a, we had Air Force nurses that we trained to pee on command. And they'd sit on this mock over the toilet. The plane would get to the top of its parabola. The lights would go on. The camera started rolling. The nurse had to pee. And, and, um, and we photographed the trajectory. Because remember, all this urine had to be vectored by airflow, by airflow into the collection device. And it worked. Well, mm. I had to say no, unfortunately, yeah. because I had two jobs and I told him I really couldn't pee on command. Yeah. And so you went to the local hospital and you got the nurses. Yeah. And did you also pay them $10 a bag? No, they were on duty. Oh. <laughs> no. So I guess that's pretty much it. it yeah. um, we had a lot of fun. We, we spent a lot of money but realized that we, we um, achieved our objective of getting a man to the moon and bringing him back safely to Earth. One mm. other thing, we do have one lady astronaut from Clearwater, Nicole Stott, who I think has been up four times. She knows Hugo. She loves him. Whenever she sees him, she's just beside herself with joy oh, because she knows that he helped to get her up there. Yeah. And it makes it's on the space station, not, not in a pause. She's on the space station. Right. She's, it took all yeah. those different categories of, of space material to get her up there. And now that the two ladies just had their spacewalk, it makes us both very proud.